All right. Welcome back to another Michael Volpe Investigates podcast that I call The Impromptu. I'm here with Jeff Riker. And Jeff, you've got a pretty corrupt, I think is the best way to describe it, child custody case out of Maryland. And uh, I wanted to update everyone on what's happened more recently. But about two years ago, Wayne Dolcefino did a video on your case that uh, did a good summary of what happened up until that point. So the first thing we'll do is get that video up, and then we'll talk about what's happened since that uh, that particular story. So let me let me get it up. All right, and so I'll play this first. And yeah, it's it's tough. I don't even know where he is. I don't know if he's safe. I know how scared he is. He was expecting to see me today. Jeff Reichert spent all of Father's Day weekend alone. His only son, Grant, now 12, wasn't even allowed to call his dad. Silence on his dad's birthday, too. This is the pain of family injustice. And he's in danger. Yeah, I, I can't do anything about it. If I try to lift a finger, I'm gonna throw it in jail. This father has never been accused of physically or sexually abusing his boy. By all accounts, he's a loving dad. Yet a sheriff's deputy sits watch over his rare three-hour supervised visits. Jeff Reichert is being given the same rights as a convicted murderer in Maryland. Hi, are you Miss Crone? That was our welcome to Annapolis, Maryland. Okay. We went there to investigate this place, the Anne Arundel Circuit Courthouse. I'm Allison Asty. I've lived in Anne Arundel County my whole life. And a judge who has denied this father the right to be a father. What am I guilty of? So I'm trying to, to protect him and nobody's listening in Anne Arundel County. This tale of family injustice actually begins north of Annapolis, in Baltimore City. After a marriage that lasted less than two years, Jeff Reichert and his ex-wife, Sarah Hornback, spent the next 11 years in court in a war over custody of their only child. They are both lawyers. Then the headlines in the Chesapeake today. Hornbeck's drunken rampage in her car, hitting multiple other cars. Charges she assaulted a cop. There were other episodes too. Hornbeck had passed out drunk at a Best Western motel, leaving her children to fend for food themselves. A Baltimore city court issued a protective order. Reichert didn't press charges because Hornbeck agreed to give him primary custody to avoid a trial. I was in heaven. It's the happiest I've been really in my entire life. Her visits would be supervised, and she'd have to routinely prove she wasn't drinking before she could see her son. Reichert and his son eventually moved to Virginia Beach. She can't drink ever around him. He's the one who's suffering the trauma, right? He knows what her drinking is. He sees it, he saw it, he was abused by it. So how did Reichert's heaven so quickly turn into hell just nine months later? I need someone to get to the reality of the, 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 what really what happened here, why? Sarah Hornback was on criminal probation, the subject of a protective order because she was considered dangerous. But she suddenly decided to seek her own protection to make sure she got more visitation. But Hornbeck didn't ask for her protective order in Baltimore City where she lived, not in the courts that had ruled against her. Instead, Hornbeck came to Annapolis, a new court, complaining about mean text messages and old allegations about her pregnancy a decade before that had already been litigated up in Baltimore. Quoting, when we were married, he pointed a handgun at my head and said, I'm a trained killer. Did you ever put a gun to her no, head? Never. Reichert was a military lawyer. Never owned a gun in my life. Never fired one outside of the army. Hornbeck started to call police. Reichert ignored court orders too, and it triggered an unusual response in what was clearly a custody fight. I had 52 law enforcement at my house in three weeks in the summer of 2020. I was arrested four times total, three times in my house in front of Grant, physically, forcibly, arrested, shackled and cuffed and taken out of my house three times. We count 24 criminal charges. All were dismissed. Hornbeck used the address of a boyfriend to get into court in Annapolis, but it gets more bizarre. 
She then claimed to live with the 75-year-old owner of this home in Severna Park, Maryland, along with Grant and her son from another marriage. There were even pictures of Grant's room shown in court, but never a picture of the boy in his supposed bedroom. And there's like you no know, pillows matching and like all these toys and pictures of Grant on the wall. And it's all staged. He never lived there. Never lived. He's never been there. Ever. Ever. Reichert says the whole thing was staged to defraud the court. A private investigator hired by Reichert determined the house was used only as a drop off for child support checks, a place to swap custody with the father of her other son. I, I drove by it. All right, to say, do you recognize this house? No, I don't, I've never been there. One big fraud? It is a fraud. There's evidence Grant never lived with his mother in Anne Arundel County. Judge Asty should have ordered an immediate investigation. She didn't. Neither did this woman, Helen Laird, a courthouse social worker appointed to help decide custody. Laird issued this 18-page report, and it was a shocker. She recommended that custody be flipped to the mom, reversing what the Baltimore courts did to protect Grant. They set it up so that it would go one way then. That's why they did it that way. You think it was a setup? Of course. Journalist Michael Volpe has done good work exposing family injustice cases across the country, and he knows exactly what happened to Jeff Reichert. I think if enough people speak out, this will break through to the mainstream and it'll stop. Remember the mom's drunken demolition derby? The motel incident? You won't find a single word about any of it in this document. Laird intentionally left them out. But it was that time period that made Grant so scared of his mother. It's not the first time Helen Laird has been accused of bias in a custody evaluation. Robert Gardner is still suing her. He hasn't seen his son in five years. I don't believe that there's any difference in the emotional, um, in the emotional loss of a child, whether that child has been abducted by a stranger or by the courts. Judge Asty clearly wasn't happy we got a copy of the custody evaluation in the Riker case. She called a special court hearing in Maryland to order the copies returned. Hey, Judge, we still got ours. But we know why they don't want Maryland voters to see this report. Because it's biased, plain and simple. I gave her probably 10 people to call. Wayne, my parents, my brother, you know, like five of the parents I coached in, in Severna Park. You know, uh, my old boss. I mean, all these people. Everyone, call everybody. I have nothing to hide. Please, call them. Laird only interviewed Reichert's ex-fiance and a disgruntled former employee who worked for just a few weeks at Reichert's home. She never stepped foot in Reichert's house, ignored many of the required rules in Maryland for custody evaluation. Laird even commented on Reichert's appearance. During the pandemic, he let his hair grow out. Laird called him disheveled. And she only interviewed the boy at the center of this custody fight one time for about 30 minutes. Yet she was able to question his hatred and fear of his mom, quoting, rejection of his mom is of unwarranted magnitude, suggesting he was being coached by his dad. Quoting, the negative scripts presented by the father are echoed by the child, often using the exact same phrasing. You won't see Helen Laird use the words parental alienation in this report, but that's exactly what she's talking about. Reichert fought back. Quoting, he's an 11-year-old boy who has seen and heard for himself very traumatic and sick behavior from his mom. But we found another court case where Laird had testified there was no such thing as parental alienation syndrome. Alienation, she said, was extremely rare. I want to go to jail. I think what she's done is criminal. Reichert has routinely ignored court orders, arguing this custody fight should have never been reopened, that his wife is using fake addresses to forum shop in a county she doesn't live in. In February, Judge Asty went even further. Jail was no longer enough, ordering Grant be separated from his dad for at least 90 days, absolutely no contact so he could get to know his mom again without interference. That's what Helen Laird recommended. 
Inside the courtroom that day, the young boy repeatedly begged to hug his father before he was taken away. I'm begging you, I'm begging you, he said. Please give me five minutes just to say goodbye. He's the only person who's ever looked out for me my entire life. It is a child's outcry we heard for ourselves. And they're screaming up and down in court saying how terrible of a person my dad is and my dad's the exact opposite of that. Well, with my dad, I was actually genuinely happy every day. With my mom, it's just misery. It, I, can, I, I don't really know how to describe it. It's just numb. Everything just feels numb. He was yanked from me. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. Worst thing that happened to him. Grant was thriving in Virginia, playing school sports, making good grades. Yet the supposed grown-ups at the Anne Arundel Courthouse think ripping a child away from his dad, his school, his friends, that's in his best interest. We've seen this nightmare play out all over the country. 90 days has now turned into more than five months. So you take kids away from the parent that they are used to, that they're comfortable with, throw them in an environment that they uh, have no control over, that they don't understand, and you think that's okay? It's probably not the smartest legal strategy to bombard the so-called experts in the case with emails almost daily, protesting, including the reunification therapist Susan Crone. Boy, she was glad to see us. Hi, are you Ms. Crone? It is the kind of desperation that comes after the silence on Father's Day. You create the parameters so that he's going crazy and they're like, look, dad's going crazy and you don't explain why he's going crazy because you're not supposed to talk about anything else. Jeff Reichert isn't allowed a moment alone with his son. That can't be in the best interest of this boy and it's the kind of outrageous punishment that should demand the judge's recusal. All while the evidence mounts this custody case has no legal business in Annapolis. Recent surveillance photos show Hornbeck and Grant still do not live in Anne Arundel County if they ever did. Hornbeck and her lawyer Brennan McCarthy ignored our request for an interview. Elected in 2010, Judge Asti has already been accused of misleading voters, violating judicial campaign standards for truth and dignity. But voters will have to wait a few more years to punish this judge for what's happened to Jeff Reichert and his little boy. In Maryland, circuit judges get a staggering 15-year term on the bench, even if their rulings punish little boys who have done nothing wrong. I'm I'm so scared. That's why I'm here. I'm scared. All right. So that uh, that was in July of 2022, and, and the reason that I said that I think I called it a great case is because of the forum shopping. If they go to a specific forum and then get these kinds of really bizarre rulings, then that is in like a screaming red flag for uh, for it being corrupt. Uh, and so that's why that's why I said it, that that's why I said that it was corrupt in the in the video. Um, so we want to update uh, the audience on what's been happening, but I want to do a Tarantino style. So we're going to go out of time order because recently about, I think like a week or two ago, you received a very troubling order that on its face doesn't look bad. So we want to talk about it. Let me get that up. And I think this is the one. And... I don't know if that comes up on your screen, but let me read it. It says, upon review of the case file, docket on April 25th, 2024, denying to address the plaintiff's petition for contempt as moot was filed in error. It is by the Circuit Court of Anne Arundel County, Maryland, hereby ordered that the order docket on April 25th, 2024 is vacated and it is further ordered that the plaintiff's petition for contempt will be heard at the currently scheduled contempt hearing on May 21st, 1.30 p.m. And it's the same Allison Asti who wrote this order. So um, before you get into it, I spoke with your attorney this morning. So I, he explained it to me. So I feel like I'm a little bit of an expert. So let me explain what happened. 
uh, you filed contempt, your ex-wife filed contempt. They were competing contempts for approximately four weeks prior to this hearing, which was supposed to be on May 21st. The, the judge, same judge, Judge Asti, ruled that her contempt was moot. As a result, your attorneys then just prepared for your contempt, and your contempt was that you were being withheld outside of the court order from seeing your son at all. And, and I think, when was the last time you saw him any way, shape, or form? When was the last time? Um, <laughs> I saw him for three hours on September 17th, 2022. Right. And before so, that, and, and that I, I, I've not seen him. I have not seen him in a constructive environment, meaning where I have him by myself um, since February 2nd, 2022. Okay. Yeah, I've and, had and, 15 hours of supervised visitation in May of 2022, and that's it. And so, we'll so, show the, the most essentially, recent. I haven't seen him more than two years. Right. Well, we'll show the most recent court order, which is very coercive towards you, but that is not what the court order says. You are supposed to see him a lot more, or at least more than what, what you've seen him, correct? Every weekend. Right. So Every weekend. Still... I'm supposed to have daily daily phone access to him. Right. I haven't so, spoken to him in nine months. I'm supposed to have right. daily so phone access to him. For that, that was one of the, the components of the contempt. <clears throat> so your attorneys, because her, her contempt was judged moot in April and then reversed in, in May, they only prepared for your contempt motion. They didn't prepare for hers because it was supposed to be moot. It wasn't supposed to be heard. This order, when did you hear about this order? As I was driving up to the hearing, so um, on, May, on, on May 21st, this yes, order May 21st. Was, was issued for a hearing on May 21st. And your attorney made a good point. He said, fortunately, I was not in trial. I was not in preparation for another case, and I could address it. He said, however, it's entirely possible that I could have had some other court appearance, and I would have had to go in, and I wouldn't have known that this order even existed. Uh, so what he did was he called you as soon as he received the order. And what, as soon as you heard about the order, what did you do? I pulled over on the side of the road um, because I'm having, <laughs> I'm having some, some, some reaction oh, now, to now driving up there. This gets a little bit legalese. So explain to someone who's not following the law, why this was so, such a problematic uh, order for you. Why did you have okay. to pull over? Because it just says mood and and we'll hear a motion. Why is that such a big deal? Well, the the, the original underlying contempt, um, the issues that I filed for were obvious contempts. Uh, I haven't seen him in more than two years. I haven't talked to him in nine months. There mm -hmm. were many others. I mean, she hasn't filed a he followed the order at all. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, probably uh, probably over 50 emails unreturned, not opened. Um, they removed me from his um, his birth certificate. Actually, I was getting no updates about his, his medical appointments when he's having some serious medical issues with obesity. Um, I was removed. I, I, they were having him do therapy for seven months when I was supposed to be involved. So there's many issues that were obvious black and white contempts. Mm -hmm. So they they in response to my motion, they filed a response to our contempt and then filed a contempt themselves. Mm -hmm. The issues that they asked for on contempt were already heard last summer. That I'm not paying child support. I've already been grilled. I'm not making enough money. You know, there there's issues that have already been addressed. Obviously, mm -hmm. I haven't seen him in over a year, uh, since over two years. My contempt is real contempt. Hers have already been heard. And their request mm -hmm. that they it, when you file a motion for contempt, you have to ask for what relief. Um, I, but result. but if if these are frivolous, then why why is it such a big deal because, that, that because you, the relief that, that they. The relief that they requested in their motion for contempt was to put me in jail again. Right. Um, I've already spent 19 days in jail over two years when I had custody, all illegally. Um, it's caused an impact on me over the years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with I think that goes without saying, I've been violently arrested. Um, you know, I was in solitary. I had a seizure when I was in jail because I was on medication I couldn't get. I mean, it, it was it's been a really difficult situation for me, knowing that I have zero criminal charges, a zero criminal record, all been dismissed. And the state of Maryland doesn't do anything about it. So um, when they ruled her motion moot, all mm -hmm. right, legally speaking, it's done. There's no mm -hmm. revival. It's done. And it made sense because the issues had already been heard. 
-hmm. There was no order issued. There's no explanation. It was just rendered moot. Mm -hmm. So that was four weeks before this hearing. So we have a right to prepare for what the hearing is involving, which was only our contempt. To make matters worse, we had depositions scheduled between in those four weeks for, for Ms. Hornbeck, and mm -hmm. she didn't show up for her um, boyfriend, John Michael. They didn't show up. They just ignored all of our discovery. So we were limited in, in our ability to prepare anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, in court, in, in the legal world, procedural world, for a judge to issue an order, there has to be a motion. There has to be a request of the party to mm -hmm. issue some type of relief. In this mm -hmm. case, they didn't even object when it was rendered right. moot. They didn't mm -hmm. file a response. I never got even a chance because it was rendered moot. I never mm -hmm. I'm, I'm entitled to file a motion in response to be mm -hmm. able to put that in court. We weren't even allowed to do that because they rendered it moot before we were allowed. I was allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So this judge, Judge Assey, pulled completely out of left field on her mm -hmm. own a motion for that was already rendered moot to be heard within two hours that the relief sought was to put me in jail. So it was basically daring me to show up so they could put me in jail again. All right. So you you pulled over. What did you do after you pulled over? I started shaking. I talked to my lawyer and you know, I, I I'm a pretty tough person. I've been through a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so I'm having these physical reactions that I'm not used to, but I'm still coherent, so to speak. And mm -hmm. I just started shaking. And you know, so I, I, I called my therapist and you know, I, it was it was PTSD. I'm suffering from PTSD based on. So you were, you were, you were, I think, triggered, and and I hate that term because it's it's misused. Because, but you were actually triggered the way that that the term is is originally meant. It was a, absolutely a, a manifestation of your PTSD was showing its effects as a result of of hearing about this order, and that's because. You were anticipating for this judge to be as corrupt on May 21st as she has been for now approximately five years. Is that a fair way to describe it? Yes, for about four years. Um, yeah. She has already put me in jail. Mm -hmm. It was called a body attachment, which, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I've been practicing law for 25 years. I've never heard of it. Um, right. And, and, she made and that was, they made something right. up. So and it you know, originally, like she it, made, and by the way, it sounds like she made something up on May 21st as well she made so what up. did you what did you do after you're on the side of the road did you go to the hearing what did you do no no because after speaking with my attorney um you know physically i was not feeling safe to drive every time i drive up there i, I moved i moved legally i was allowed to in my order move to virginia four years ago and i have had to drive back and forth because of this incident so over went, 50 times you went back home to virginia so let me let me I turned around and went home I, let me just detail my what, therapist your, when I got what, what your attorney told me then happened. So now your attorney on your behalf comes to court. They don't face Esty, I think is her name. They don't face, they face another judge. They explain the situation and the judge says, you're right. The, the, because this motion, because this order came so like out of left field, we're going to hold off and hear it at another date. However, your motion, your motion for contempt for not seeing your son for a year, for violating all of these other things, since you weren't there, he expects that motion to be heard. And since you weren't there, that judge then dismissed your motion. Is that a fair rendering right. of what happened? Right. Uh, so it's I, and you, if you had, let, let's say, in hypothetical, you got yourself together and decided, you know what, let's see what happens. I'm going to go to the hearing. What do you think? would have happened if you had accompanied your attorney to that hearing? Do you think they would have done the same thing and, and pushed? No question. I would have been in jail. They were they would have put me in jail and kept me in jail until the merits hearing in June and just mm -hmm. dismissed that hearing. It's okay. really exact. That's their only option right now. I mean, the facts are so one sided right now based on it's not a family law case anymore. This is this is a civil rights case. They, they've already gone to such extreme to pull this off, to abduct them. They now have to be held to that standard. They can't go to the DC, DSM and all these other statutes. They've trumped that based on they've already done what they've done to me and my son. And mm -hmm. so. They can't have this be heard anymore. So that, that this is I filed this motion to modify in August in Baltimore County, where he lives, where she lives. She's mm -hmm. never lived in this county. He hasn't lived in this county since I lived here. And, four years and the, ago. the court will in neither county will allow it to be moved. And and I think I let's make sure we get this right. You live in Virginia. So obviously it's not that county. 
she doesn't live in that county. So right now, this county has a case for two people, neither of which live in the county. And so right. uh, venue and jurisdiction definitely sounds like very boring, tedious legal stuff. But it is very important because if you could go anywhere, then you would judge shop, you would forum shop as your uh, ex-wife has done. In fact, your case is the poster child for why venue and jurisdiction are critical parts of all law cases because she has abused it and the courts have allowed her to abuse it. And as a result, she's judge shot to a judge who is clearly sympathetic to her, biased against you for whatever reason that we'll get into as, uh, in, in future videos. But uh, it's because they have completely ignored all elements of the law as far as what venue and jurisdiction should be allowed to hear a case. Uh, right. But, and, and, and every time I've gone to other venues in other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. justifiably, um, mm -hmm. I, I filed stuff against her in Virginia um, mm -hmm. because I live here. And when Grant lived here, everything's mm -hmm. granted right away and, and they bar access for her. Right. Mm -hmm. in, in Maryland, Baltimore City gave me final full custody you know, five, mm -hmm. four years ago, whatever it was. You know, I, I've had full custody for three and a half years. I had 50 50 before that. Baltimore County, in these instances, every time we've gone there since August, they and grant what we're this, asking for. This wasn't uh, in Wayne's video, but this is important. Prior to everything that happened with Judge Asti, you didn't just have an order, you had an agreement that was supposed to be ironclad. So explain how that agreement was supposed to be ironclad. Never go back to court. Well, and, and what, how did that, how? Yeah, yeah we. What, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I could go into a lot of detail about it, but our first case, underlying case, made law in Maryland. It, it was, you know, I had to appeal everything. It's it, Our case is is studied by every family law person in Maryland. They have weekend retreats about this thing, you know, mm -hmm. which I'm not proud of. So we, she's, I've been trying to settle. I mean, I, I don't want, you have to, you have to give me days to explain the dynamic based on her mental illness. However, after 10 years where she had, she was under criminal probation for child abuse, she was under protective order, and we had another tr custody trial coming up. I had a, a civil case against her that was, I was going to win for like a million dollars for tortious interference of custodial relations. Um, mm -hmm. So I had every every reason, I, and I could have filed criminal charges against her on the on the, uh, the, the child abuse stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, and in exchange of that, we we worked out a settlement agreement with a mediator. Both of our mm -hmm. attorneys were involved. It was 48 pages long. And the gist of it is, was to never go back to court ever, ever, ever again. Everybody involved can attest to that. It's actually in the agreement that there's a mandatory mediation clause in it. And mandatory the, way, mediation. the way she got around it really is corruption, but she went to court for a protective order, right? She didn't she go went to court. file a fake protective order, order fake modification. Order. Right. Eight months after that 48 page right. agreement. So let, let's, uh, we're still on a time order. Wayne did his his uh, news, that video right before the custody trial. So he, even though we could all see what was about to happen, he didn't actually do uh, a video before the custody order. So I'm going to get that custody order up on the screen. And, um, and as I get it, just give some of the highlights. And I think you called it coercive. So explain towards you, not towards her, but how is it coercive? And I'll scroll through it as you explain it. You're talking about the final trial order? Yeah, from I think September okay. of 2022. Okay. So how, um, how is it coercive? Well, first of all, I would say most people would be embarrassed that that would be shown in public. However, that is so ridiculous. I don't care because it's it's it's... It's insane, this order. Um, mm -hmm. the, the first thing you want to notice that I've noticed when reading it, and I've read it a few times, it's really hard to read, and mm -hmm. I've done the research on this, is that it was clearly written before the trial even started. Now, well, right. well, give, give some specifics as to why you believe that. There is, like, first of all, her words, okay, the transcript that goes along with this, she announced within the first hour of the trial that she was going to be ruling from the bench. As soon as mm -hmm. it was over, because it would spare us the agony of waiting for her to write the order. And mm -hmm. she was going out of town on vacation. So mm -hmm. she said that first. Then when you look at the semantics of it, she did. She finished. We finished closing arguments at 11 o'clock or 1130 on the last day of trial. And she mm -hmm. had the order ready to go by noon. Mm -hmm. And no, no judge can write that that quickly. 
Mm -hmm. And if you look at the actual de details of the actual order, there is no reference to anything that happened in the two weeks of trial. Not a mm -hmm. single reference, piece of evidence, mm -hmm. nothing quoted, nothing. OK, mm -hmm. so it's very easily ascertainable that that was written before the trial started. Mm -hmm. So that then then you just go through the obvious. I mean, th there's 20 factors in Maryland. All right. Okay. And, and let me let me read a key portion of this order ordered that father shall have visitation with child in, Mar in Maryland, supervised by either father's mother or Miss Caruana or another supervisor designated by mother each Saturday. From 10 a.m. until 3 p.m., mother shall drop off and pick up the child with the supervisor for each such visitation and location in Maryland agreed upon by mother and the supervisor. Father shall not participate in drop off or pick up. Father shall promptly pay all costs of supervision, if any, and sign all documents required. And again, prior to Judge Esty ruling, you were the one who had sole custody. So the idea that she would reverse it to this extent without you finding, without finding a physical sexual abuse or otherwise, in essence, parental alienation, though, as Wayne pointed out, very sneaky. They don't actually ever use the term parental alienation. They just describe it. Um, but no, you, her, attorneys, you, her attorney has said it probably 100 times in court. So it, it mm -hmm. is definitely claimed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so uh, he, any, any other... Um, uh, well, the interesting part of that is at, at that time, I had not seen him in mm -hmm. seven months um, mm -hmm. in, in any way, shape or form productively. It was 15 hours in May supervised by a police mm -hmm. officer. So no, nothing to do with that. When, and, you know, and I could go back and forth and talk about what they did for her. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the key part, that's not really, I, you know, you, the better better term to use for that would, would be a jail sentence. That, that was a jail mm -hmm. sentence. OK, this mm -hmm. this is this is prison. Um, mm -hmm. If you do the math. Uh, first of all, the first weekend after this order, I tried to follow it. My mom scheduled visitation. She lives in Florida. She's 78 years old at the time. She bought a plane ticket and reserved a hotel room in advance, paid for everything, or, or, uh, tried to organize it with Sarah. And she, Sarah said it's OK, which is not even up to her. And then Sarah canceled on on the, the Friday night at like 1130, canceled everything. So my mom lost the flight and everything. And that, that's the last time I've even had any return uh, email from her and, and that and that's interesting because it also says in the order order that one's father has successfully completed 12 consecutive saturdays of visitation without missing any such visitation for any reason other than illness uh or any cancellation by mother and without violating the terms of such visitation or this order the parties shall notify the court and hearing will promptly be scheduled to determine whether supervision should continue so what she did is she didn't give you a chance to have 12 consecutive visitations, right? No. And, and after that weekend, Michael, mm -hmm. I didn't hear from her again. I, I, I can send you an email. Every week I said, I want visitation this week. Right. I want to schedule it with my mom and, and nothing. They go unopened. And that that has been the case. She has and, not and returned this is a single you one. Filed, this is what you filed as contempt. And <laughs> here's another part of the order. Ordered that within 45 days of this order, father shall have a follow-up psychological examination by Dr. Lefkowitz, the psychology previously appointed by court on or about December 31st, 2022. The father shall have complete neurological examination completed by a board certified neurologist of father's choice. Father shall follow up any and all recommendations for follow up care by Dr. Lefkowitz and the neurologist. She didn't order that your ex wife have any kind of uh, psychological examination uh, or follow up, did she? No, just, notice there's no, there's even no though, basis for it. Right. Even though what we saw in Wayne's video that she had a series of incidents, one after another, after another in 2019, that she's got. A well, I can make it worse, Michael. Michael, make it worse. Mm -hmm. I had a, I have a therapist I, I've been seeing for three years going into this weekly therapy. They denied her being allowed to be an expert. Mm -hmm. Judge Asty knew that she knew exactly what my condition was, and they don't mm -hmm. want to hear my condition because they're the ones who's created my condition, the, the trauma right. that they have caused me. Um, it, so and then another is... another caveat here you need to know about is Dr. Lefkowitz is a defendant in my upcoming federal lawsuit. Right. Um, and, he and he wrote a report that was completely fabricated. I never talked to him. I didn't do enough right. to and support I, it. They they will do that. The court that is they will it, it, a poison pill by forcing you to go to a psychologist that they know is biased. And, and the time that, that I talked to him, they made me talk to him within two days after they took Grant on February second. 
They mm -hmm. made me do a psych evaluation right after they abducted my son in court. And that's mm -hmm. the last time I've seen him. And I had to then do a, and it was 10 minutes of an interview and the rest was, was uh, online questions on a software program. Make it worse. He spent an hour talking to Sarah before my psych evaluation, which, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it was all, all made up. Um, my, mm -hmm. my therapist has completely confirmed it. I mean, I, I could have confirmed it for you. Any, any, any person could read this and know that it was rigged, uh, especially mm -hmm. if you know me, but even if you didn't know me, you'd know it was rigged. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he knew it was rigged, right? Because mm -hmm. his, his behavior after I knew it, when I started calling him out, he disappeared mm -hmm. and he knew that what he did and he knew I knew what he did. Mm -hmm. So, right. Well, um, they, they've got you paying retroactive child support, more child support. Uh, so the finances there are, are, are pretty cool. Not only that, well. I've, I, in our underlying first case, I was ordered to pay way too much child support and I paid $40,000 extra to her that I'll never get back. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I waived child support while I had full custody for three and a half years. She was supposed to be paying me child support, and I just waived it. Yeah, you know, I didn't need right, it. I didn't so want it. In 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 effect, you have this completely coercive order, and she still didn't follow it. Even the minimum still amount, didn't follow it. Right, even the minimum amount of uh, visits that you were supposed to get, you didn't get those. And then the judge just last week, May twenty first, engineers. So that uh, so that your contempt motion doesn't get heard by filing this completely bogus eleventh uh, hour order, uh, and that way rigging the case again so that, that mo contempt motion doesn't get heard. And my guess is that's because if it was heard, even that judge couldn't ignore the overwhelming evidence. She would have had to rule in your favor. And this was her way of making sure she didn't have to do that. Is that a fair mm -hmm. way to describe it? Right. No one's heard from Grant they, the, since September of 2022. Really, no one's heard from Grant since now, February so 2nd. This isn't just punishment for you. It's punishment for your entire side of the family, your mom and, my and mom. obviously yourself. Right. And Grant. And I want to get one other thing up. There is a, um, let me, let me find, there's a DSS report, Department of Social Services report from February. Um, but the DSS report uh, was called in by my mom, actually. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the interesting part about this is it was called in in October when Sarah started um, physically abusing Grant and taking his phone. And then they started trying to tape record and listen in on our phone calls. Um, mm -hmm. Why my mom was involved is because last summer they made, even though I had not seen Grant now in, in this long period of time, they filed to put me in jail um for telling grant that i'm doing everything i can including filing a modification and they said that was involving him in the proceedings mm -hmm. and they they issued a further contempt and restriction on me to have my mom when, supervise when my you phone say call you you told grant you were filing a modification he i don't know if he called you but he either called or emailed or somehow got in touch with you and he was despondent and you said grant i'm doing right. everything i can filing a right. modification just stay calm it was a way to calm right. him down. There, right? there, the, the, yes. So starting in September, I was talking to him every day from 2022 to 2023. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the spring of 2023, he knew that he was going to get whisked off to Maine for the summer. He wasn't going to see me. He started panicking. They were doing he was she was driving him to school with alcohol on her breath. Uh, mm -hmm. Her boyfriend was constantly drinking and screaming at him about me and all this stuff. So he ran away. All right. He was at Airsoft on a Saturday. He ran away, called the police. Police came, picked him up. They called me, and but they can't give him to me because I have zero custody. They're like, if you had one day of custody, we'd give him to you right now. This kid is so scared. He wants to go home, and but we can't give him to you. Is there? A, so then he called two of our friends from when we used to live there. They called me and they said, you want, but they can't. They can't give him to him right now. They have to do an investigation first. So right. they called a mobile CPS unit and they did an investigation, and then they did a follow up investigation. Um, at his school and mm -hmm. his school called Sarah and told them and it, they're not supposed to be alerted the parents mm -hmm. especially the parents that are being investigated like her and she right. came to the school and when he left the room with the investigator they her and her boyfriend put him in the car and he, this was there was still eight days left in school that he never came back and they right. took him right up to Maine they drove him all the way up to Maine and I didn't hear from him Okay, so they the took him out of they took him out of the jurisdiction as there was an ongoing Every uh, summer they've done it. Yep. As right. a, against the CPS. But, but you could, your 
you're not supposed to be allowed to take a child out of the jurisdiction when there's an right. open child protective services case. Right. Uh, and they that, told her and it was in the report for her not to do it. And she still did it. And, they, right. and she signed over guardianship on a piece of paper to her parents for the summer in Maine. Right. All right so I, now I haven't talked to him. I have missed two Father's Days coming up, coming up on my third Father's Day, two of my birthdays. Two of his birthdays, two Christmases, two Thanksgiving, everything. Everything's now turning right. into the, threes. The, when you say two, the later this year it'll be three for all of three, these where everything's turning right. into threes. Right, correct. Now Wayne talked about it a little bit, but what what was Grant's life like while you had custody of him, and what was he doing? What was he achieving? And what is his life like now? I, I could, uh, I. It's night and day. Um, I've coached for 15, 20 years. I mean, not for years. And I can't tell you how much my son was thriving. And I'm saying that objectively speaking, because I had kids going through COVID. I had them during COVID. We mm -hmm. moved three times during COVID. We had to move different states. We had police showing up at our house. He had all this stuff going on, right? But he managed, and I'm not going to take any credit for it, right? Mm -hmm. Because he listened to, the, to, he blocked it all out. And we finally got here. Here is where I am now in, in Chesapeake. He was at a school that the soup, the, the principal had just been named the principal of the year in the state of Virginia. He was in all honors classes. He was tracking for eighth grade algebra, which he's now in eighth, or eighth grade pre-algebra and getting a D. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was he was on for, for three seasons. He was playing tackle football where he was on a team that was ranked top five in the country. Um he loved it. He was the only white kid on the team, which he loved, which I, he was just fully embraced. He, he got along with everybody. Mm -hmm. He had a girlfriend right up the street. He had 14,000 followers on his Instagram page for airsoft because he was on an actual semi-pro airsoft team. Mm -hmm. He had friends everywhere. He had, we had friends over here every weekend for sleepovers. He had, he, he had a great life. Now, mind you, he had just moved here mm -hmm. and he was made president of his homeroom. Mm -hmm. He was in shape. He had he was working out once a week with a basketball because uh, I I coach him, but I'm his dad. He was just mm -hmm. doing workouts with people. And then I once basketball season started, he was the starting point guard on my team, which is an AAU competitive team. Mm -hmm. And he was the tallest one on the team. I mean, he was blossoming and becoming. And and the ironic thing is, the day they took him, the next day in school was the first day that he could go to school without masks. Mm -hmm. And he had gone through all of that. Mm -hmm. and, so now what's his life yeah, like he, now? He was his, well, well, I'm not done. He was also in weekly therapy with a mm -hmm. great therapist. It's just and he's been ordered to be in therapy since 2022. And he has no there's no record of therapy for the last two and a half years with him. He was well, well, I can't so I want to just tell one story about his grades. Mm -hmm. Three weeks before he was taken, I went to meet with his math teacher because his, he was had a math tutor and he was because he had a because he was skipping schools, he was getting different. Or not skipping school, he was switching schools. Mm -hmm. I want he, he was you know had to make sure he was on track for algebra. So mm -hmm. I met with his math teacher. But when I was going to, when I showed up to meet her, she had every one of his teachers in that room, and I thought I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh no, what did he do? And and they all just wanted to tell me how great a kid he was. They took mm -hmm. time out of their day. They knew I was coming in. And they said, he's an amazing boy. He just got here and everybody loved him. And, and that to me, that, and then three weeks later, he was taken from me. And I had to face those people and tell them he's never coming back. And the team that I was coaching, he's gone. You know, I'm mm -hmm. labeled a child abuser. You know, that's mm -hmm. a, the, the travesty in all this is that I coach all the time. All these kids that I could have impacted the last four years, they've, they've taken that away from them. Mm -hmm. Label me a child abuser. Mm -hmm. Right. With no evidence. There's, there's no evidence of child abuse. She has a criminal record of child abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when, when they coach. say when they say child abuse, what they're, what they're referring to is parental alienation, which they claim is a form of child abuse. No, they can't even they won't even say you said that yourself. You said they had right. not they, used parental alienation. Right. They're, they're describing they said they're involved, they, right. they said that they're right now. They're saying that clip in the video that you heard at the beginning is mm -hmm. abusive. When they can't, one, Judge Assey's not allowed to see it, right? Mm -hmm. Or else she has to recuse herself. So she says mm -hmm. she still hasn't seen it, but that's what they're using now as they switch abuse. all the time is what the abuse right. is. Right. So right. I don't know what it is. What abuse know what it's is. Right. All right. So, so what, what is he like since since your ex-wife got him? Well, you heard his voice. That was about six months into it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But 
Last time I talked to him, he gained a lot of weight too. He's obese. He's -hmm. extreme. He's too. His her lawyer said in court, he's he's a monster. He's six foot two, two hundred and fifty pounds. Well, that's a problem. Yeah. How old is he? He left here. He left here at five foot nine, one hundred and sixty. He's gained a hundred pounds. Hundred pounds. Apparently, he's grown. You know, seven inches. I, I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I can't tell you how my son is doing. I wish I could. The mm-hmm. last time I saw But do you know him, what his grades grade. are? Do you know what his he's grades are? He's getting terrible like? grades in a terrible school that I've requested to speak to him about it. I've, mm-hmm. They will they ignore my calls. They don't return my. They filed for a protective order against me last summer. The school and it was did. dropped. The, the, school the school did. did. And in that coercive order, it does say you have a right to get his uh, educational records. So if they file right. and, and a they protective won't talk order. To me. Right. They're, they're filing a protective order against a dad who has every right to those educational records. All right. La- last question. I don't know how you want to answer this, but some things. Well, going he's not playing any sports. Right. He's not playing, he's not any, playing sport. any sport because they and don't was want this to, presented to a third party. The, was this presented at the trial before? Judge it's, it's, it's been pre- it's been presented to Anne Arundel County Court five times this year, and they have ignored it completely. They ignore it every time. What, they come after what me. Do you, like, What saying, do you think is going on? When there's forum shopping and this kind of blatant abuse, I, I don't think it's simply bias. Is there more to this story than just a biased judge? Is there, no, is there, there a reason? There's, a lot, for- again, there's more. There's a lot more. This story, this case has never been about custody, has never been about Grant Reichert, ever. Mm-hmm. It's night and day when you compare my, my parenting to Sarah Horbeck. Anybody mm-hmm. will tell you that. You could just look at it on paper. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the factors of custody and what they're supposed to do here have never been in, in, uh, applied. That's why they never recognized the final consent order that had all this other, you know, for 10 years of, because they just wanted to start from scratch in Anona County on July 10th, 2020. That's why they are arresting me and create this whole false narrative about me, regar- disregarding the complete history mm-hmm. of Baltimore City that's already made law in Maryland because she mm-hmm. keeps having to litigate. And they started their own narrative. Now, the problem is they don't have the facts to back it up. I'm not the person they say they are. But the, the issue is this isn't just Judge Asty. OK, mm-hmm. you know, this is something that the the appeals court has been a part of. And I hate saying that I'm an attorney. I've been I, and I'm not some podunk random attorney. I practice at a high level in the state of Maryland. And mm-hmm. that may be why what is going on here. Right. Mm-hmm. I had access to a lot of information, a lot mm-hmm. of secrets, so to speak. Um, you know, I was also in the Army JAG Corps for 12 years during or 11. You know, I don't know what the total is, but 11 and a half. Uh, you know, I don't know, but I know you have to have a lot of power and influence to do something like this. And I know a lot of people who think that I have information that have a lot of power and influence. Right. So I, right. You, I'm not you made someone with a lot of power uh, angry or nervous. And you think right. that person, those people are taking it out on you. And then your son has become a pawn in whatever little strategic game these people are playing. Is that whatever you, anybody would have told you, my son is my life. Yeah. I retired from th- that. What I'm describing, I retired from that life to be a full time dad because of how awful a mother she is. I mm-hmm. used to pray to God every day to just give her some inspiration to be a mother. It's a lot easier if she – and she, so I walked away from – I was about to be promoted a major in the Army JAG Corps. I mm-hmm. walked away from being general counsel for a, what, a, a $10, $11 billion company. You know, mm-hmm. And I, was, I, I walked away from those dream jobs, so to speak, to be a dad. And mm-hmm. he was thriving. He was thriving in Maryland when they started this. So then mm-hmm. I moved to Virginia. He's thriving in, Mar- in Virginia. They take him. Mm-hmm. So it's clearly a hit, so to speak, on Jeff Reichert. If you mm-hmm. want to take me out, anybody would tell you, you could mess with anything you want. You burn my house down, take my car, punch me in the face, anything you want. But you want to but, mess with me, you take my son. Your son. And they did. And, somebody and they did. can disguise it in this disgusting family law issue. The, the family law, what they did is they took family law because it's so corrupt it's easy, already. It's easy to corrupt because there are very few right. rules. Those few rules are rarely followed, as you saw. With that May twenty first order, uh, and your exactly. attorney said he's never seen anything like it. And I asked him, uh, and, and it was hard for him to answer. I said, "Is is there a rule that allows or disallows her to do this?" And there really isn't. She she can file an order 
on the morning of a hearing and say, oh, this other order is uh, that I said was moot, that's moot. And by the way, we're going to go ahead and hear this. On the morning of, she can do that. And as he pointed out, she was clear that, no, we're going to hear it today. Uh, so there, as you can see from that order on May 21st, there are a few rules. Almost none of them are followed. And that's why it's so easy to corrupt. And that's probably why the powers that be chose the family court arena to corrupt. Anything else you wanted to add about the case? Well, with, with, well, God, I mean, that's an open-ended question, by question. <laughs> so, um, you know, with respect to kind of staying on the topic, you know, the, the other issue is that they've forced this, uh, the, the custody trial to be on her last two days as a judge when it clearly needs to be longer. Um, mm -hmm. I've asked for an extension and they won't, she denied the extension. Um, mm -hmm. and then now they've set all this stuff that these in the contempt, um, mm -hmm. And there's sanctions filed for her not showing up for depositions all on those two days. And it's, it's impossible to be able to do, not right, to mention was, what right. evidence are we allowed to present? There's no right. evidence now because right. no one well, has access to Grant. Our, no one can talk to Grant. Right. It was a dog and pony show. They they why, why give you more than two days? The the order was already written. Uh it was just the performance art anyway. So she didn't need to give you more than two days because she'd already figured right. out what happened. Uh all right, Jeff, thank you for being here. All right.